I have seen that a lot because um, I worked on the other side of it. I, I've seen uh, people brought into a &E in recess who have um, ended their, their, their life with, uh, at their own hands and then they still have to come to hospital because, uh, you know, we still have to... It, 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 we, we don't know the time of death, so we have to assume they are still for resuscitation. So I've seen the end of that. And then I've always spoken to the relatives, usually a girlfriend or the mother, and said, did you have any inclination at all beforehand? And 90%, Steve, I would say, say no. We know they were struggling, but we didn't know that this was the straw that brought the camels back. So you said just before you mentioned the WhatsApp conversation, you mentioned Jordan, you knew he was struggling. And, and I know you said something about, he had, he had a, um, I've read his bio partner and then he had a pet cat, I believe, you know, a nice little family of three. Um, so was there any inclination uh, before he got diagnosed with anxiety, I believe in his late twenties, was there any inclination that week or that month I know people suffer from seasonal affective disorder from September onwards, they get low in mood. It happens to me, it happens to a lot of people where mood does dip from September to March, particularly in December. December and January are the worst months of mental health. And that can, again, be related to sunlight exposure, vitamin D deficiency. There's actually a medical reason for that. But the weeks preceding December the 4th, was there an inclination that his mental health has got slightly worse? Yeah, I, I, you know, this is something we've looked back at many times. And if we look at the series of events and, and leading up to that, um, and just to kind of put into context, um, when Jordan was first diagnosed, you're quite right, say late 20s, around about 30 years old, um, with clinical anxiety and, and depression, um, his support process via the GP was to be referred for cognitive behavioural therapy, a series of 14 weeks. Um, and... Nothing he discussed with us, really. We knew he was going, but, you know, he was an adult, had his own house. And and uh, so we never got into the depths of what those conversations were about. He was also prescribed um, antidepressant medication. Um, initial medication didn't really suit him, so that was changed. And um, his journey after that was one, really, as he started to, to come back to us after a very low period when he was first diagnosed. Um, was that he got on with his life and his career, and whenever he felt he was uh, his depression and anxiety was taking over again, he would go back for a further prescription of antidepressants. Right. So no other talking therapy, no other support mm -hmm. mechanisms. Very typical man in many respects. I will self-manage this. And he did. To the outside world, he, he did. We now know from having read his journals, which we found in his house subsequent to his death, that he clearly wasn't managing. Mm. That there were clearly a lot of issues um, there. Even in fact, we got to understand what was discussed at his CBT sessions as well around body dysmorphia, something we had no idea about at all. So in the weeks leading up to, to Jordan's death, um, yes, he was. we knew he was struggling. Yes, his girlfriend, Charlotte, who was had a base in Sheffield, but would come and stay with him in Leeds. She, you know, we were in touch. His, his mother and I, we, we divorced, uh, separated in 2005, but have always remained very, very close. We were in regular kind of contact with each other. Independently, we would phone Jordan or message, see how he was doing. So we were aware that he wasn't in a good place again. He did go and visit the GP around about 11 days before his death for a further prescription of antidepressants. And having spoken with the GP um, after Jordan's death and asked very specifically, the GP said there were no obvious signs there that Jordan was suicidal. In fact, he asked Jordan the question, mm -hmm. um, are you considering suicide? And Jordan's response was no. Mm -hmm. However, what was really telling to me was that when we discussed how Jordan presented during that GP's visit with the GP. He did say that Jordan was very upset and in tears during that conversation. Now, wind back the clock to those almost four years ago now, my knowledge of mental health and suicide was pretty well, well, one out of 10. You know, it, I'm probably being kind to myself there. And you kind of look back on that and think, well, you had a son with that, you know, clinical anxiety and depression, should you have known more? Really simple answer to that question, yes. 
that's it. Yes. <laughs> um, and that's a message really to everyone yeah, out yeah. there. Learn whatever you can, you can do. Um, but um, we certainly had no inclination um, that Jordan was considering that. But when you hear of a 34-year-old man who is in tears in front of the GP, you start to question whether simply signing over a prescription for antidepressants and by the way, here's a card with a phone number to mind, is enough of an action. Mm -hmm. And we look, I've come to fully understand the pressures that the NHS system is under, that GPs are under with their six, seven minute appointment windows. We know it's a system issue. It's not, a, it's not that people don't care mm -hmm. at all. But from our point of view, suicide never crossed our mind. Or certainly not my mind. I don't know about any of the other family members, but it's not something that's ever been openly discussed that anyone else thought for one moment that Jordan might take his own life.